Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome to the Age of Quarantine. I'm David Castillo, your host for tonight. I'm going to be joined shortly by George from Deaf Heaven. Looking forward to it. I uh, want to thank you guys for joining us. It has been a wild bunch of weeks and uh, we're really excited about how our Kickstarter is going. And thanks everybody for uh, helping us, you know, keep Vitus alive. And uh, yeah, just really been enjoying everything. And uh, got a little bit of Esplon here. Cheers to everybody on another Monday. And we're just waiting for George to join up. I hope everyone's staying safe and hanging out. Hey, I miss slashers and prostitution too. <laughs> Great bands from Brooklyn, if anybody is wondering. And uh, yeah, oh yeah, mm mm. Why? Well, I, I mean, drinking's what I do. I mean, now and again, but uh, relax. Um, if you guys want to ask George a question, you can go into the little question box at the bottom here, and I'll be taking some questions from you guys towards the end of the interview. And uh, yeah, that's basically what we'll be doing. So we're just waiting for George to, to sign up and, uh, and join us real soon. Um, I also want to kind of shout out a couple other things that have been going on uh, in the live music space. I think maybe some of you as have seen us post about Neva, with his, which is the North uh, National Independent Venue Alliance. Check that out. Uh, they're really helping uh, independent music. So that should be really, really cool. Um, over 800 venues have signed on. Uh, if you guys want to join in on that, that'll be really cool. And uh, yeah, they're just doing a lot of great advocacy work and helping everybody, you know, bring, bring everything together as far as... Uh, trying to keep the independent venue scene alive. So it's uh, very important. Check that out for sure. And like I said, if you got questions for George, bring it on down there. He should be joining us in a moment from California. Let me see if George's have any issues with what we are doing. Oh, there comes Kathy. She's teaching her how to do it. Shout out to Kathy from Sergeant House, one of the ballers of the game. Uh, she's uh, helping George on the tech right now, so that'll be that'll be good. Sergeant House to the rescue is correct. Kathy is is definitely right often in that position and does a wonderful job. <laughs> Blast beat with keyboard. <laughs> so you should be on shortly. We got about an hour. Like I said, use the question box if you got questions. I don't know, we're hanging out, you know? I'm wearing this Swerve Driver shirt from a, a show that we did at Vitus. I thought it would be kind of appropriate for a deaf heaven kind of thing. I thought that was kind of cheeky, even though you probably will only see me from here. Uh, I still I appreciate a good black t-shirt game. Well, I think that we I think that we might have something here. Uh-huh. Voila. Voila. We're connecting with George. There he is. <laughs> Voila. Just a couple minutes late. No problem. I, I, I kind of appreciate, I enjoy that. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel like in times like these, you can't be late for anything. So it kind of feels a good almost, right? It does feel good. I'm going to take advantage of it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm letting go of all appointments. I don't, uh, I don't need this life anymore. Nothing, I, I, nothing's tethering me. I, I gotta say, I was uh, I was cooking dinner just now, and I was like, "Yo, I gotta speed it up because I got I got George coming on." I'm like cooking this chicken, looking at the clock, cooking this chicken, looking at the clock, like that's your whole game. Um, oh, jeez, I know, I know. So, George, you got about like an hour, you know. Um, again, guys, I'm with George from Death Heaven here. My name is David Castillo, one of the owners of Saint Vitus. 
This is the age of quarantine. And uh, I've known George for quite quite a long time. We have a good good history with Deaf Heaven as far as them playing the venue a lot. And uh, we're just going to go into a lot of George's musical past and do a lot of fun stuff. By the way, great couch. I got a green couch, so I'm feeling your couch here. Thank you. I'm, I'm upstairs right now. I'm not in the couch. I'm more in like an author's zone. Um, next, next time you're in L.A., I'll give you the tour. Oh, nice. I love that idea. Well, one day. One day. Um, so... I've been starting off all my interviews very in this, in the same manner. And, um, I, I, cause I think it's sort of important. Um, you know, music is on lockdown, so everybody's home. So you're in Los Angeles. I'm right about that. Right. Where would you, have you been on this day if you were, uh, not quarantined? Oh, let me think. We would be, I might be in the Bay area. Today, I am. Yeah, I think we're playing San Francisco tonight. Uh, it's one of our last shows of a six and a half week tour. And we're playing with Inter Arma and All Your Sisters. And, uh, and wow. we just played LA two nights. It was great. <laughs> Loved it. <laughs> yeah, it was killer. <laughs> there you go. It's just kind of amazing to think about those things, I think, and to kind of locate ourselves a little bit. Uh, because now obviously everybody's home and home is not necessarily what we all signed up for, especially if you're a musician, right? So, uh, let's, let's, let's start back a little bit. Speaking of the Bay area, right? Bay area. Are you from there originally? No, I'm not. No. Um, actually I am from Gainesville, Florida, uh, originally. Wow. No, I know. Uh, well, I'm really letting it all spill right now. Uh, Dude, twisted existence, amazing. <laughs> from Florida, uh, I lived in. I've lived in California most of my life. Um, I lived in Los Angeles when I was really young, and then from there, mostly lived in the Valley, uh, mostly in Northern California. So the Bay Area for us, um, Modesto, more specifically, is kind of like where everyone goes or everyone wants to go after high school. It's like the. It's the. You know, it's the realm of possibility out of the small town existence. So I, um, I did the small town thing, and then um, when I was able to, move to San Francisco, and uh, and I lived there for a lot of years prior to moving to LA. Ah, cool. Yeah, kind of. Well, I'm from Long Island originally, so I was in the kind of shadow of, of a big city too. And I was like, New York City. That's that's the that's the goal. That's the that's the destination. where I need to get to to get my fix of music and stuff. So um, I want to just kind of take it back to the the earliest times, man. When, when was you know when did the attraction to music just first start becoming something that was was in you? What were some really early early memories? Yeah, yeah. We had music in our house. Uh, uh forever uh for as long as i can remember my mom was uh younger when she had me and so she was very into uh contemporary music and um i remember listening to you know i remember she had like the duran duran ordinary world single uh she Peter. yeah you know you know what's actually funny uh because we had like green day and we had michael jackson we we had, we had kind of uh it, it sort of ranged from from those two spectrums and uh one thing that she did have what she had an mtv uh uh buzz bin cd it was wow. like stations and and i was thinking about it recently and uh and how much it actually probably really informed my my future because it's like it's radiohead Cranberries, White Zombie, Danzig. Um, I, me I remember listening to Mother in the House. Uh, uh, I actually have a photo that uh, I got of my mom kind of like in a room with, with Glenn, which was funny. Um, Damn, your mom's mad cool. She's cool, <laughs> man. Yeah, no, she is. She's really cool. And, and she had great taste in music. And she went, I remember like her going to concerts and things like that. So it was all very, um, it was all very available. And then when I was around 10, 11 years old, kind of started my own uh, venture from there. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I mean, for me, uh, my, my parents are, are from Bogota. And so for me, it was always like pop stars, you know, it was like Michael Jackson, FM radio. That was like the only really English speaking music that I like listened to until I 
I started to make some friends and then like their parents were like hippies and shit. And they were listening to Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and the Allman Brothers. And I was like, what is, what is this? I don't really uh, understand, you know? And then I, it kind of got the bug from that and my older brothers. Um, when you started kind of venturing into your own, what, what was that like? Were, were you kind of drawn into punk first? What was kind of the first thing that you're like, this is my music. I mean, I love Duran Duran more than anybody really should. <laughs> I love them so much. So it's, that, that's a great place to start. But when you were like, okay, uh, I have my music now, mom, what were those, what were those moments like? I remember I, when I was really young, I had like, I had like, uh, Ixay on the Ombre and like Dookie and things like that. And, and that kind of like California punk thing was, um, was, was in there pretty early. But new metal, for sure. Like my actual venture. I mean, when I was when I was that age, when I was first getting into my own music, I was living in Bakersfield. Uh, of course, uh, you had like Corn and and uh, and Edema and uh, and what have you. And I remember rock radio was very big there, and bands played um, Centennial Gardens, which was the old Rabobank Arena. Um, and you could see, you know, like trust company, <laughs> uh, and, and you know, and and you could see, uh, you could see, you know, bands like Orgy and, and things like that. Um, and that's really what what kicked it off for me. And then when I got to middle school and I found peers who were into the same thing, um, then I got into further exploration and and kind of really started out with like big metal. Uh, Pantera, Slayer, Metallica, Sepultura, uh, you know, all the, all, all the majors. Um, and uh, that, that kind of informed truly the rest of my uh, listening experience as far as like heavy music went. Yeah, yeah. totally. Was there uh, like a group of kids? Is there like anybody significant that like, you know, really, really kind of brought you into that? Or is it something like a record store? Uh, uh, a, lo a, a place, anything like that? Totally, totally. On, on a more local level, because um, it was funny when, when I, I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't understand what like, local music was. It, you know, I, I didn't either. I never got that until like it, that like broke my brain. I was like, whoa, people do this like in the town over, not at Nassau Coliseum. Yes, <laughs> but then. Well, what is this? And it's cool. So for us, it was Jerry's Pizza. And I went to a lot of my first local shows at Jerry's Pizza in Bakersfield. And um, and I was so thoroughly confused by the whole thing. I mean, and, and I'll tell you why. I, I had a, my friend, um, I had a good friend, Jeff, and his older brother played in a band, which now to think about it probably just sounded like hate breed or something. Um, it was definitely like a like a tougher metallic hardcore kind of thing. I didn't know what hardcore was. I didn't know it, but I remember his brother had cargo shorts and and uh, and some kind of collegiate shirt, but the bassist had nail spikes and was spitting blood and had like long hair and looked like he should be you know in mayhem or, or something. And and I was like. You know, I don't even think that these people know what's going on. So we were all kind of lost together, it seemed like. Also, let me say, when, when I made, like, older brother, I mean, like, he was in 10th grade. We were in 7th grade. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, and that's leagues apart, though, when you're a kid, right? You're like, oh, my God, dude, they got a car. They got, they have, it's a different thing. And yeah. I was, and I was, and, and, yeah, I was like, this is, and weed. I was like, this is crazy. Um, yeah. And I think maybe it started there. And then, yeah, of course, I had, you know, us, uh, us uh, heavy music folk are kind of few and far between sometimes, especially in, uh, in, in smaller towns. So there was just a couple of us. But, you know, uh, we, we played together and, and, and tried to make the, the best of it, I guess, and then, um, until I moved. Yeah. yeah. So what were the, uh, when did you want to start participating? Because it was like, you know, you see this world and you're like, huh. And at a certain point, it felt like the democracy of kind of like punk music or hardcore music and stuff like that made it kind of like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to grab a couple of friends and see if maybe I can give it a go, you know? And that's a, and that's kind of a really um, crossing that threshold. 
I always think it's like a big deal, especially yeah. like for a singer or something like that. You got to get over a lot of things, you know, in here and, you know, outwardly yes. in front of a lot of people. <laughs> so when did you decide to go, Hey, all right, you know what, let's, let, let's try and do this. Almost immediately. I mean, I loved it. And I mean, like, even if it wasn't with other people, it was me with a lyric book in front of a mirror, you know, practicing moves. Uh, uh, the internet still wasn't, you know, uh, what it is today. So a lot of it was just kind of like imagination. I remember I got what really changed, like, my whole attitude towards it was, uh, was the Vulgar videos. I got three Watch It Go um on dvd and i like i was like this is hedonism and it's like adults that can do whatever they want and they get paid for it and it's obscene and phil and salmo to me at the time was just like holy revered just this, like larger than life and i would you know um i would put on like far beyond driven and, and like when, when like before mom got home from work and i would like sit in the mirror and like pretend like I was, you know? Uh, yeah. Um, him and Tim from vision of disorder were like my absolute fucking heroes. I mean, I, like I said, I'm from Long Island, but, um, yeah, I just remember that on broken video and they're just like the one light bulb, no bullshit. I hate yeah. God long sleeve. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, yo, what the fuck is this? I was just like, enamored and I, I like in a lot of ways though, like I knew I could never be that person you know that's like the Mike Tyson of singers or something yeah. like uh, uh, but at the same time I was just like who are you like this is insane right and those images are really powerful I mean like I, I found out about Crowbar and, and I got and stuff like that because of the clothes that Phil wore mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely right and and that I you know and I was just but but I was also you know, there's so much about Pantera that's that's uh, that's larger than life, and 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 they come from a world I don't, and you know the whole nine. So, so it was there was always kind of this like sense of detachment. I didn't feel like I could uh, embody things that they did at whatsoever, but I wanted to play aggressive music, and I remember just kind of I remember playing guitar and playing poorly. And more just waiting for other people to be good, you know, because I'm a great singer. I mean, that's the most like singer thing to say. Uh, but yeah, I was like, somebody get me a guy. There's got like, to be, be a drummer in the world. Really, it was that. It was like who the like who plays drums. I still I still feel that way all the time. I'm like if I'm sitting around, I'm like, is there someone that plays drums? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know about you know uh, tinkering with ideas of my own or something. Um, but yeah, I guess that was the beginning of it. And it wasn't until maybe I was 15 or so that I, that I really um, found a, a group of guys to, to play with and, and start the whole gambit. What was the first band? What was the name? <laughs> I always loved the high school band game. It's so good. Uh, it was called Fear and Faith Alike. It was... Uh, That's a hard name. Sure, sure. It, it was... <laughs> it, was uh, it was from... Um, I'm pretty sure it was from an uh, Ernest St. Vincent Millay poem, which is so me, uh, even even at that age. Even then, Jesus <laughs> Christ, George! I've been soft you, my whole life. It's, it's you overachieving. Money. Like I'm probably like you know quoting like George Orwell. He's out here, but that's why you're you, and that's beautiful. It's a, um, oh, it's a it's a it's a predicament. But uh, yeah, it was good. <laughs> good to do stuff we played barns and churches and uh the place that i grew up was very that it was the ultimate it was like we were so close to the bay area and what i would consider like you know like you know good music but we were very cut off and and so few things um kind of made it down so so the so what was big in my time was like metalcore and like death rock it was like afi and uh you know like the orange county stuff like a trade and conditions and things like that and Huge. that's what we that's what we were all doing um and and uh and that's what made it to us you know this is funny um i, I was thinking about this too uh that band early graves mac daniels uh, rest in peace 
were so a few years later um, were very much uh, kind of like who who I wanted to play with and and uh, and kind of like a, a scene I wanted to be more part of. And I remember Mac telling me like like no one's allowed to be lame because the internet exists, uh, which I thought was amazing. <laughs> Because uh, he was like, he was, he had no sympathy for like small towners. He was like, no, like the internet exists. Uh, you don't have a, you know, you have no choice. But that said, it, it it hadn't. It was weird. It was like, it was like outside of things like Kazaa and and I guess in my space, but was difficult to navigate. Um, I don't know. We were kind of insulated. So. So the internet didn't didn't play like a, a big role at that point, and most of what we got were from like magazines and like Headbangers Ball, and um, and that's what we that's what we did. Yeah, the, the Headbangers Ball thing has come up a, a couple of times, and it's really interesting to see. You know, some of these shows, I mean, big impacts, right? Like you know, these the just kind of gateway things. So. I'm probably like me, you're, you're like, you know, ready to just get the fuck out of your small town and, and get to the big show. Right. Which for you is San Francisco. When you first kind of headed out there and stuff like that was the mission like, Hey, yeah, you know, I want to, I want to kind of spread my wings a little bit, try and find other like-minded people. And I guess, uh, you know, uh, we got to talk about the, the Carrie and George, you know, uh, you know, Genesis yes. origin story. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's one of my favorite stories, uh, about one of my favorite people we met. So I left Bakersfield and moved to Modesto in the middle of my freshman year of high school. And I met Carrie there and I was, we were both 14. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and we got along great, uh, shared music and, and everything else. We didn't actually play with each other though. Carrie always played guitar. I always knew Carrie as like a phenomenal guitar player. I remember, um, you know, I remember him like playing me stuff from like his, cause he had high school bands, he had like punk bands and stuff. And, and I remember him playing me like ska riffs and being like, this is fucking cool. Like, I can't believe you can do this. You know, <laughs> like, you know, like I'll buy me and shit. Like that. Um, oh. That's and, wonderful. Uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, and then, and then we we took very separate kind of. Um, even though we had a lot of like common things, we took separate musical journeys. And 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 he got into stuff, and I got into stuff. And then we reconnected around um, seventeen, eighteen, mm -hmm. uh, in a more in a more serious like collaborative way. And then, um, and then we played in a band together for a few years based out of Modesto. Um, and then from there moved to San Francisco and that project had kind of dissolved. And, um, and also we had kind of written the first death heaven song as part of that project. So once that kind of fell apart and we were San Francisco based, we took, uh, that idea and things that we had been in through and, and we started kind of applying it towards death heaven. And, uh, and I was 20 at the time. I think our, our demo came out or something. So, Wow. Yeah. That, that it's just kind of a interesting journey. And when, when you first started uh, playing and uh, you know, what was when, when I, when I first listened to death heaven and that was like Rose of Judah era, like, like pretty like early on in the game, Obviously, there was some black metal influence, but I felt like there was so much like gravity, hardcore, and like screamo influence, like Portraits of Past and Orchid and Combat Wounded Veteran, and and like you know even some power violence stuff. And there's something kind of distinctly American about it. Um, did that kind of w w when did that music kind of enter your lexicon, and how did you feel that played out? Because I feel there's something about the tone of Death Heaven and like the things that you write about and how you kind of communicate them that really to me is it's evocative of the spirit of, of, of a lot of those bands, but sonically moved into new territories. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I think that's cool. I think it's a cool, um, I think it's a cool observation because we did have a lot of that. And a lot of that came from Carrie's side. Uh, and he would be probably better to ask about that. But, you know, in a general sense, 
hardcore was always the most available thing. Um, and they, you know, hardcore always has the most shows and always has uh, creative, engaging types that are at the show. So it's easy to find community in those things. And I think that throughout the years, we've just maybe consciously, but also unconsciously taken those influences and, and pushed them forward. So when I thought about playing a live show, I wasn't necessarily thinking about standing and singing. I was thinking about being aggressive. I was thinking about things that I had seen growing up in, you know, uh, VFW halls. Um, and, and I think that above anything else, those influences, that influence, that energy um, was its greatest gift because, you know, we, uh, we had a lot of, you know, kind of, kind of not, I don't want, not spastic riffs, but they, you know, on some Baylor, especially there's a lot of, um, what Carrie calls like ADD riffing. And I think that that, uh, I think that that concept comes from hardcore and, you know, things that, other things that we've been into growing up, like 3-1-G was like a big thing. And I think we took a lot from <laughs> that. I think that like, that period of um, of like sassy hardcore with uh, you know uh, Arab on radar and um, some girls and, and that kind of thing that some of that energy maybe um, I, I don't know but it, uh, it 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 was definitely with us and it um, it matched uh, our black metal influence as well we just kind of kind of just wanted to throw it all together I don't really know. I think in a way there's an organic aspect to it, right? It's just kind of what you're into, but something about that combination of the things that you were doing at the time, to me, sounded distinctly American in a way that I think was, was like, to me, it was, it was different. It didn't sound like, Hey, we're trying to be like, you know, spice and comments, like, you know, Norwegian style or anything like that. To me, it was like, this is kind of an American nice take on this without being like a bedroom thing or something else like that. It's bringing this other energy into it. And I think that that's why in a lot of ways it connected with me and, and found a home with all these different people. Totally. And, and, I, and I'll agree with you. I think that um, especially with our black metal influence, a lot of it comes from, from America, um, most of it. And being in the Bay Area, uh, you know, we had, yeah, there's Flinzer Records at, at, the, at the time, especially, which was very um, black metal. Great label. They are absolutely great label. Um, continues to be a great label, uh, and uh, and things like uh, you know bands like like Ludacris and such, and and kind of Aesop Decker's influence in general uh, was so massive to us when we were younger, and and you know is is still prevalent. Um, yeah, uh, those were those were all the kind of things, and we were we were young and, and fresh faced, and we just wanted to get in it. And we wanted to play shows and. Um, and we wanted to find like-minded people. And yeah, it, it, it's simple. Just reaching out with that with, with that spark, and I think you guys, you know, it, it can't be uh, too contrived, but it just kind of comes forward. And so for me, that was sort of the impression, you know, that that I was, you know, just kind of getting from you guys. And it was such a lyrically too, such like this sort of like confessional sort of approach to me like there was like this scholarly this literary kind of like aspect to it that i, I really like appreciated because you know I, I like all of these bands that we've been just talking about i like them so that kind of really came across and i felt like for for a minute that wasn't that was not really kind of how people were were approaching uh their vibe with the lyrical content and stuff like that what were kind of certain things that were kind of really, were there any kind of lyricists that sort of influenced you a little bit or were you kind of just kind of speaking for more of an internal place or is it really not lyricists, but more writers in general, poets, other, other folks like that? Yeah. Um, I, th I think that a mission from the beginning was to try and do something uh, that was a bit more hard on sleeve um, and uh, emotionally open, um, you know, uh, and 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 I just kind of kind of write like that naturally. Uh, as far as as far as like lyricists go, I mean, things that I've always drifted towards, like Elliot Smith um, or like Paul Simon or or uh, like Liz Harris, um, and then and then writers. 
uh, Bill Say Maria Loines, Amy Lowell, um, Andre Breton. I, I read a lot of uh, women. Um, I, I think that uh, I think that I kind of channel that voice a little bit sometimes. I don't know. It's a it's just it's something for for words to do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And and sometimes when you're just looking for things. I feel like everything that you sort of take in, you know, when I'm re- when I've been writing letters for like primitive weapons and stuff like that, sometimes I don't know where it comes from. And then like much later, I'm like, Oh, I read this here or I had something there. And I just accessed that somewhere, but the music kind of brought something out of me. And I was like, Oh, that's where that came from. But I'm like, I, I didn't even think about that. So I'm like, I found that out about myself, you know? Totally. I, I think it's, I think what's, it's cool about lyrics too and, and aggressive music and I, I found this I found this to be true more at home when I'm kind of just tinkering around with uh, with like clean singing and 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 piano playing and 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 writing that way and how the lyrics will simplify quite a bit and I'll fall into more like traditional like rhyming schemes and things because it feels more naturally for like melody but you and I have this benefit of like uh i i can i can really stretch my vocabulary everything is rhythmic you know and it doesn't uh the the music contains all the melodies so i'm able to have a lot of freedom with what i write and i think above anything else that's what i really appreciate um that death heaven gives me uh kind of a limitless vessel with which to do these things uh whereas more traditional singing i feel a bit more confined Mm. That's a great, that's a really interesting point. Cause I feel like over the life of the band, the melody of the band has sort of in, just continued to sort of increase through, you know, somebody they're into ordinary corrupt human love. And uh, I mean, black break, I think maybe uh, like a step into, into some of the heavier territory, but I think you could see that arc. And uh, I was listening to ordinary corrupt human love actually uh, earlier this morning, just, just to put some, some stuff into my head. And what I kind of thought was, I was like, wow, like George is like the heaviest part of this band right now. And, and I thought that that was really interesting. Like the voice is like the heaviest part of the band for large stretches of that record, which I, I find to be interesting. And you've, you've kind of steadfastly stuck to that. And I think that it's a really interesting choice. And, and do you just feel like that just provides you the freedom to just let go? I do, yeah, a, a bit. I, I have, as the, as the music changes, I, I do at some times have a complicated relationship with it because um, while my voice definitely has progressed over the last few albums, it has done so in a more aggressive manner. It hasn't like, it hasn't gotten softer. It's gotten a little bit like nastier. And, um, and those things do uh, conflict um, occasionally, but I think a, that's part of what makes us us, and and B, I like being the source of intensity. I think that the music has emotional weight to it, and I'm happy to bring up the more visceral uh, side of that. It's just kind of part of it, I think. Yeah, I, th- I definitely agree, and I, I feel that kind of, yeah, I feel that, that tension the way that you guys play with attention, that's kind of the band, just in general. Like, and, and you feel the drama play out one way or another, and that's kind of from, you know what we're, what we're all looking for. As far as like performance style and stuff, obviously, uh, you know, anyone who likes Death Heaven and stuff like that, George puts on a show, man. My boy here puts on a show. And, you know, um, I look at that and that's, that's free. You know, I see, I see a free person and that's kind of like one of the most amazing things to me is like when I get to see a performer and I feel like they're not thinking there's nothing there, but like just, there's like a conduit. It's just like going out. How did you kind of approach performance and did you, how did you get to these, these points, you know, because I feel like there had to be some big misses there, some trial and error, some feeling about, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to do that. Or was it always like, I'm here and this is where I'm at. Infinite misses. <laughs> so many misses. Um, yeah. A ton of misses. And, and, and I guess explain further uh we got 
picked up by Death Wish fairly early on after we released our demo. Um, they approached us really early on, uh, maybe six months after we had put it out on Bandcamp. And, uh, and I think at the time we'd only played like five or six shows. And, mm. and, but we wanted to tour and we wanted to work. And I knew like the first conversation I had with uh, Trey McCarthy from Death Wish was like, you know, we're in it. We, we see this as an opportunity and we don't know where it's going to go, but, but we'll go. Um, and so we started touring and we cut our teeth on the road. And I mean, you know, we didn't have the time to like get good locally. So, I mean, I was a mess all over the country. Uh, yeah, we hardly knew what we were doing. Um, uh, uh, which is great. I mean, and, and I would drink so heavily, uh, especially in the, and, you know, uh, and I, I don't anymore, but in those early years, um, you know, I was always drunk cause I was scared and I was nervous and, 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 and et cetera. And that led to like more problems anyway. Uh, as touring went and as we played more shows, it just naturally developed and, and I felt more comfortable and, I did a lot of theater when I was growing up, and I think that that part of me uh, has stayed true. And I think I like big moments of expression, and uh, and I try and physically express the music to my best ability. And um, and so I kind of just wanted to be like larger than life. An easy answer would be uh, Phil and Salmo meets Freddie Mercury. That was kind of always. My I was boom. <laughs> I, what, I, I do. Like you a, nailed it. Really, From the horse's mouth. A very poor man's version of that. I, uh, when we toured with Inner Armor the first time, I was talking to Mike and, I, and I, I told him that and he was like, fuck, man. Yeah, I hate it. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> nailed it. Uh, I think that, that, yeah, it's just a really interesting thing because I, I think it's good for people to hear that, that this is all a development, you know, it's a development of anxiety and fear and your voice and coming to terms with yourself and what you're saying. And, and all of this kind of builds into the death heaven that goes and plays in front of 1500 people today. You know, this is, this is a, well, this is quite the process of, of becoming and, and actualization. So that's why I like to get into these stories because it, bands aren't good overnight, everyone, or they're not who they are overnight. This takes a lot of work, right? Yeah, it does. And, and we're, and, and if, you know, to, to anyone that is watching, uh, that, that should be said a million times. It's so true. And I constantly am, I'm always learning. Um, you know, the, the first big step was those first, um, with those first touring years. And then the second big step really for us was when we toured with Lamb of God, which was incredibly difficult, uh, you know, um, and we had power trip, uh, on that tour also. And thankfully like we could, you know, I could like latch on to them and, and, and complain, um, because, <laughs> because it was scary and it was like big shows and, and, and Randy would often talk to me and give me pointers and tell me like how to do it. And, and explain to me their audience and how to treat their audience. And as the tour went, because the first show was in Pittsburgh, and I mean, one of the roughest shows we've ever played, bar none. And by the end of the tour, which ended in Los Angeles, I mean, I felt so much more powerful than I did starting out because, because I, I was growing with this audience size. I knew how to control audience more. Um, and, and a huge help from him, uh, uh, Randy was so instrumental in, in, in helping me kind of fill bigger shoes when I needed to. Uh, those things happen all the time. Um, totally. You got to be learn how to become a bigger stage band. I mean, I definitely um, have seen certain bands too that I really love, but at, at, at times I was like, Oh, they're being put in this position now and they don't necessarily know how to be that quite yet. Could they, but sure, but it's like there's some on the job training here that's that, that's happening, and it's really cool that Randy did that. It's a really awesome uh, you know story for for you to share with us. Super stand up guy, uh, one, one of one of the best. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I remember uh, you know, and, and then you see that same band maybe a year or two later, and they're like 
you can't even imagine them in in, in, a, in a small place anymore. You know, like you guys, I saw the last time I saw Death Heaven was at Brooklyn Steel, which is a 1500 person place. And you, I think you guys did two nights and, uh, and it was, it was amazing. And I was like, wow, we got, we got all the way here. Um, and that's amazing. I, I love to see that. I love to see uh, not only, you know, people that I work with, but people that I consider friends continue to grow uh, from, you know, playing early shows at Vitus all the way to now. So that is pretty fucking great. Uh, I, I appreciate it a lot. Um, I, I, that show in particular was a very big deal. Um, uh, and, and I too felt a sense of like, you know, uh, disbelief. Going back to Vitus though, let's talk about Vitus really quick. Uh, I'm here for it, man. What do you got? I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about this interview this week and I've been thinking about my times with you and, uh, and times at Vitus and how funny so many of them are and like just how many times like you know i probably like endangered myself uh it's a dangerous like, place it is dangerous like one of the crazy but one of the craziest weekend ever it was we did a sold out show 2013 at vitus with marriages and nothing open which mm. is cool uh and we played two eight it sold out so we did two eight five the next day uh, uh, yes, 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 yes. 285 Kent. 285 Kent on the 4th of July. And, and I'm pretty sure Fred Bissarro put it on. My God. I mean, I needed like a, you know, like we had to still be on the road and I needed like a week to recover. <laughs> <laughs> I remember thinking, I remember thinking like, like New York is like, like the most beautiful monster. Uh, I just, I left broken every time. Um, but that pretty much. And and the 2012 show that Brandon Stosi helped put on for Northside. Uh, yeah, we worked on that one with yeah. uh, with uh, uh, Indian jewelry. Yes, yes, exactly. Indian jewelry. It was weird. Uh, Pitchfork and and us, and it was me, Peter, and Brandon. And yeah, it was you guys, Indian jewelry, and I think Sonnet opened too. I did open, yeah. We were and it was fucking great. I think did you guys play Sunbather for the first time that night? Live? We played, we played Dreamhouse, I think. Yeah. Dreamhouse. That was it. That's my fucking claim to fame. I got to be able to tell the story <laughs> right. So I'm glad we, we got this ironed out. So we played Dreamhouse for the first time. Right? I've been saying Sunbather for like five years. So I'm glad that I got it out of the way. We had, we had, uh, we had, we were in between guitar players and we had our friend Gary playing guitar for that show. It was the only show that he played with us. And he has a, project called black monolith which is like this crusty black metal thing that uh that a friend of mine and i uh put his album out a couple years later um the whole thing was just very interconnected it, uh it, it was it was a really special time i remember we went to the pitchfork office we were so broke and we like walked in there we looked really shitty and really looked like <laughs> for brandon and and like the whole office with headphones were, like looking up at us confused i mean we and just being like like kind of far away money <laughs> <laughs> i picked you guys up that day yes yes i, wa I walked i walked so i used to live a couple of blocks the uh, pitchfork is in brooklyn and uh, or was in brooklyn at the time and i lived like five blocks away so that was the first time i ever met george i like met him in this like office and there's all these people like writing about music <laughs> all you heard was this and then like in their headphone line, and i'm like there's these five guys in like leather jackets and like black bond dentures and like I'm looking for them. Hi, how you doing? And we had lunch, and like that's the the the, the start of a lot of things. Um, and like you said, from those days, and like just to see the progression of the band and all that has been super cool. And uh, yeah, just just continuing to grow it in the the different aesthetic realms that you guys have been uh, wor working on. Um, I really, before I get to a couple of fan questions, do I just want to um, touch on a couple of things that you're doing right now so we got like a live record that's about to come out right we do yeah um it is it is uh it's kind of like a sessions album it's somewhere between the two um where in light of this tour being canceled we wanted to uh give fans an opportunity to still hear those songs a lot of which we haven't played in a long time in a in a live setting and also the the things that the songs that we do play um more normally have evolved uh, quite a bit in the live setting. And so 
uh, those different versions will be presented. And it was kind of just a way to say thanks and, and, and to just hold on and, um, and, and we'll, we'll be with you again. Uh, you know, I was talking to, I was talking to my friend Christine and I, I was, I was saying that, you know, if this year, if this year goes without us playing a show, which it seems like it will be, it'll be the first time since I was, I'm 31. It'll be the first time since I was 15, you know, going a year without a show. It's just, it's kind of wild. Um, and uh, and I think that this kind of helps us a little bit too, um, simply with just the 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 idea of being busy and uh, and and not not slowing down and and letting people um, stick with us. Yeah, there's there's a there's a lot of um, there's there's a lot just like a lot of time for reflection and and something like that. I mean, it was interesting because when I you know I, I read something recently, um, you guys were just talking about. I think it was around ordinary corrupt human love time, but like you guys were just talking about how you always signed up to be in a band that was really going to like do things, right? Like that that was it. So I think for a lot of musicians, dealing with themselves while they're at home for an extended period of time is like the big difference, right? It is. Uh, I'm trying to stay busy. Um, productivity is hit and miss. Uh, we are Same. also work, we are also working on new music, um, and so I have been able to focus some energy that way. Um, but yeah, it's a little confrontational. It's weird thinking about um, you know for the last ten years I've had the next year, if not two years, kind of planned out for me because tours and things get booked so far in advance these days. Uh, we're always usually on a two, three album, uh, two, three year album cycle. That to not have that now does feel a little bit uh, uh, precarious. Uh, we're, we're, we're kind of just like in suspension. So this live album helps helps us ground a little bit. Um, and and writing new material helps me ground a little bit, and I'm just just keeping my fingers crossed for a, a brighter future. <laughs> I think that that's that's what we all are hoping for and can contend with, you know. Um, so I'm going to dive into the question box and let's see what we got. All right, cool. Oh, this this one works pretty well right here. So, how are you guys recording the Ten Years Gone live LP from Eve's Is Evil? How are we doing it? Uh, we're doing it live. Uh, we track a lot of our albums live. This won't be, uh, so, so it, it won't be uh, too different. Um, and we're gonna just try and give a really raw approach. Uh, we're doing it with Jack Shirley, who is uh, a god among men, um, and who was uh, gracious enough to work with us as we kind of like figured out this plan in real time, you know? Uh, the first week when everything went in shutdown, I mean, my in my email and my, my phone were just like so fucked. Uh, after, like, what a week. Right? I'm just like, uh, so so we're hitting up, you know, uh, we're hitting up Jack and being like, look, I have this idea. Um, you think you could swing it? And uh, and thankfully he was on board. And, uh, and we're gonna kind of, kind of, you know, kind of treat it like a, um, Almost like a like a blue note kind of like like session album. This is your like lit, your like kiss comes alive. We're gonna pump in some Vitus crowd sounds. We'll do. <laughs> you know what? We joked about it. Uh, we can make. I just wanted like a couple claps. You know, like just five or six spaced out. Maybe like a someone clearing their throat. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's good. All right, let's dive back into the question box. Boom, boom, boom. Um. Okay, here we go. What brand and color is your nail polish from Star Noir? Actually, this is this is this. The, the comments are really about the the Manny, right? So we got the blue. Well, Max wants to see my feet. Uh, also, yeah, I'll, I'll send Max a photo later. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I got I got a nice royal blue. Um, I can't tell you the brand, but I'll I'll tell you this. I've been I've been trying to keep normal um, mm -hmm. for the most part. I've been like shaving, you know, I've been showering, uh -huh. trying to like keep up. But one thing I've done, and I'm sorry for this, but I've, uh, I've grown, I've started to really grow my nails mm -hmm. uh, out of pure boredom. And 
they look, you know, I'm, I'm keeping them up. They look good. Uh, and then, and then I just got kind of tired of staring on that way. So that's what George, I'm, could I tell you something um, more personal to myself is that I grew up in a nail salon. Uh, my, my mother owned a nail salon called fingers, faces, and toes in uh, on Long Island. And I, and I pretty much grew up there. I learned, uh, I learned a great deal in that place. And I, I appreciate what you got going on. I think it's great. I think Dee would improve. I think you and my mother are the only people that I faced on today. So I think this is consistent with just my, my experience of quarantine. Take a screenshot and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll see. You know. Dude, Didi will hook you up. It's fine. The <laughs> Colombian dream team. It's all good. All right. So let's, let's dive back in. We got a bunch more questions. Let's see. Uh, this is kind of an interesting vocal routine. Vocal routine. Uh, I, this is, a, I, it should be more scientific than it is. It is not. I do not have one. I'm really sorry. Um, I get asked this quite a bit. Uh, and much like playing a show, my vocals have been a lot of trial and error. I uh, used to, I used to blow my voice out all the time. Um, and just through sheer determination and ignorance have I continued to pursue uh, screaming in this way. Uh, I used to tell people whiskey and cigarettes. Um, yeah. But I think that my voice has gotten better since I stopped those two things. Uh, anyway, I, I, I think that my best advice is just to go hoarse uh, all the time, and then eventually you'll stop, and it'll rule. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I honestly, for someone who, you know, has done things maybe in in similar, you know, veins as you have, uh, I got no, no really, like, life-changing advice either. I think you just kind of got to go for it and, and you know, trial by fire it a little bit, you know. Uh, here's a, a good one. This one's from Brennan Chatter. Hey, George, huge fan from Calgary, Canada. What musical groups are you most excited about these days? Mm. Well, you were about to go on tour with two, all your sisters in Interarmo. Yes. Um, and you guys pick great openers always, so maybe we could start there. Yeah. Uh, I, you know what? This is something I, I don't feel uh, bad about. I take great pride in, in who we tour with. Um, I try to take out acts I think um, could hopefully benefit from our audience and who also kind of contextualize the tour in an interesting way. Um, and it's always really nice when people notice it because not all artists are so hands-on, but it's something we kind of uh, try to take some pride in. Uh, that said, what am I, what am I excited about? Uh, I have to be real with you. I have not been listening to too much because I am writing a lot and those two things are kind of divorced. Um, but Midwife just put out a record forever. That's probably my album of the year um, so far. It's extremely good, and I highly recommend it to anyone that's uh, looking for something new, especially in a, in a time like this or kind of just hang out indoors. Uh, mostly, it's a really um, it's really good for the mood. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you know, uh, I, I've been really kind of stuck on a, a couple of things myself. Uh, Andy Stott's uh, last record has been on constant rotation and uh, also the last big brave record between those two. And then uh, I like to run to Iron Maiden. <laughs> and they, okay. they, give, they, give, they give me rings. Those, mel the, those harmonizing guitars give me rings, you know? So, so. So this, is, this, is, this is something we can talk about because uh, I, I do a daily workout and in my workout that is probably when I'm listening to music the most so for like a ton and um dying fetus is the wrong one to fuck with that's like my ultimate pull-up that's um, hard right now i, 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 I want to let you know that i was doing push-ups in between texting you before this interview <laughs> to get it going and i was listening uh to that ooh la la song by by run the jewels and uh and a little push a team mixed in and so that's where where, where we're going out in the, in the quarantine workout space. That's very yeah. good. And like, if I need to lift something, I, I need, I need some wrap, maybe yeah, some less yeah. gun. The, 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 
the key Glock uh, mixtape, highly recommended. Really good. Really solid. Okay, that's good to know. I mean, you know, I I, I got key, I mean, I got no nails. I, I got like, and maybe I don't know. I I need a better routine, maybe. But uh, we'll be with that. So I got time for a couple more questions. We got about five minutes left. So here we go. Oh, this is a good one. How did Death Heaven link up with Bust and Edge for the split from Sanguine Gold? Great question. Um, Great yeah. band, Bust and Edge rules. Yeah, let's uh, let's let's definitely shout that out. Uh, I love those guys. Um, I was really into. Uh, I was really into, I was really into two, I think when, when we first started and then I think they put out three around the time Rosa Judah came out. Um, and both those records were, were, were phenomenal. And, um, and I'm trying to think of how we actually first linked up. Um, it was through Harry Cantwell, uh, who also plays in Succum and, um, and, uh, and he is awesome. And I think I, I think it was literally just something simple like like your band rules. Uh, we 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 played with them. Us and them opened for Marduk uh, at the Park side in San Francisco, which is hard to think about. And yeah, I got I got kind of punked by this guy in the audience. It was <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good. It was like our third show, and this guy was so upset that we were opening. Um, I don't think Boston Edge got the same treatment, but. Uh, but he was not happy about us. Um, and maybe that was the first time that we really kicked it, but that is a great band. Um, and one that, you know, I hope keeps on keeping on. Yeah. Cool. I love it. All right, cool. So I got time for one more and then we'll kind of wrap everything up. Uh, this is a good one. All right. From Jack Zima, how do you approach writing minimal lyrics for long songs, saying more with less? Yeah, uh, that is, you know, that, that's 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 been one of the biggest challenges with my writing is that I don't like to write a lot, and I think that um, I think that I can be more powerful when I'm when I'm more concise. Uh, to the point where like songs like Vertigo is like, that's the one that always comes to mind kind of feels a bit like word vomit um, or, uh, or tunnel of trees was the same way when I was kind of young and trying to fill space as best possible. Now it's more about interesting phrasing, um, trying to split up syllables and words, uh, repetition um, and, and letting the guys also have enough space to, to let the music breathe and, and it, it does a lot on its own without me, um, which makes things easier. Yeah, cool, totally. Well, we got two minutes left. I just wanna say thanks to everybody for tuning in and hanging out with us. Uh, thanks for every, to George for hanging out with us from Dev Heaven. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, George. It's just great to see you, um, you know, in, in times like these. And uh, thanks to everybody who's been donating to the Kickstarter and helping us out and doing our thing to, you know, keep Vitus going. And, uh, you know, we put on a lot of great bands and, and made a lot of great relationships. So this means a lot, George. And, uh, you know, hopefully down the road, we can do a little bit more and uh, look forward to seeing the live record and hearing it and, you know, having it in my hands. And uh, we got like a minute left. If you have like, you know, maybe one last recommendation for the quarantine for these, for these, these kids out here, what, what would you say to them? I'd say buy a robe, make it a, make a winter robe, but also like a summery, maybe like a silky kind of robe. Um, oh, I got a great one. A say, Ralph Lauren. There you go. And live in it and, uh, and love in it. And that's my, that's my advice. That's beautiful. George from Dev Heaven, everyone. Thank you, George. You're the fucking best. And we'll see you tomorrow night with Chris Enriquez. He's got a great cast. We got fucking Alex from Testament, Sergio from Dev Tones, and a bunch of great people. Peace.